But we will move on now to our next major point. And uh, we have looked at uh, biblical foundations. We've looked at the church planter and the different types of church planters and uh, the different ways a church planter might be bivocational or uh, employed. Well, we're going to look now at church structures. This is going to be important to clarify this early on in this course because the type of church structure that we are going to try and develop is going to make a big, big difference in the way we actually go about planting that church. The methods we choose will need to fit the model or the structure of the church we expect that to develop into. And so we're going to give a, just a sort of a quick overview of some of the different forms that church life can take. By church structure, I don't mean church buildings and architecture of church structure. I mean the way the life of the church is structured. So two key factors are going to be a key in determining the appropriate church structure. And let me say that the Bible is really quite flexible. Sometimes we tend to think there's really only one way to do church. And uh, that's the way the church, my church does church. That's the right way to do church, is my church is the right way. And this is where, uh, you know, some of the difficulties between different denominational groups, the Pentecostals do it one way, the Baptists do it one way, the Roman Catholics. And so we tend to think my way is the right way. Um, when we go back to the Bible, everybody has their biblical arguments. Well, this is why we're doing it like the Bible says. But uh, the interesting thing is sometimes when people say, well, um, we're going to be a church according to the New Testament. We're going to be like a New Testament church. I like to ask the question, which New Testament church? Um, you want to be one like the one in Corinth? People fighting all the time and getting into trouble and lawsuits? And, well, no, you don't want to be one quite like Corinth. No, not that. Um, uh, do you want to be a church like a church in Jerusalem where people were going to the temple? Well, I guess not. We, didn't, we don't have temple. But yeah, and the people were zealous for the law of Moses. Still, way back in, in the later chapters in the book of Acts, they were really a Jewish kind of church. Well, no, I don't think we want to be that kind of church either. You see, the New Testament even has a variety of different types of churches. Some were Jewish background, one were predominantly Gentile background, and some had not had their, their leaders installed yet. Uh, some had deacons and elders. We know the church in Jerusalem developed its process of leadership. It was originally just the elders, and then later deacons were called. And so we see in the New Testament certain basic principles about how a church should function. Church should function as a body. Church needs spiritual leaders. Church should be doing certain things like evangelism and, and edification and teaching. Uh, we think of the description in Acts chapter 2 of, of being devoted to the apostles' teaching, prayer, fellowship, breaking bread. These are things that all churches would do. But the New Testament leaves a lot of freedom as to how we specifically structure. Do churches have to meet on Sunday morning? Can they meet Sunday night? We know Paul had midnight meetings where people were falling asleep and falling out of windows. Um, do churches only, should they only really meet at 10 o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock in the morning? Um, what about a midweek prayer meeting? Should every church have a midweek prayer meeting? Sometimes we have these traditions that our church has had and they're good, they served us very well. But does that mean every church needs to be that way? How about the way leaders are chosen? Should leaders be chosen by those who are already leaders? Should leaders be chosen by election, by having a congregational meeting and people vote? How should leaders be chosen? Well, the New Testament doesn't give a lot of detail on many of these issues that are important in the life of a church. And um, so we, what we want to do is discern biblical purposes and principles but at the same time then, see how those can take different shapes and forms that fit the society, the culture, the people we're ministering to. So the two factors are going to be biblical guidelines, values, and purposes. We believe those would be unchanging because they're what God has said the church should be and what the church should accomplish. At the same time, we have the cultural context. 
And so we need to study the cultural context. Just a very simple example. Uh, when one of the first uh, American missionaries, uh, Adoniram Judson, went to Burma, he tried having sort of a typical kind of church service like we would do in the West. You know, you'd meet Sunday morning and someone would preach. He discovered that if he had some sort of a, a discussion format that was very common in the Buddhist setting where he was, people would come and listen and they would discuss. It was a very different sort of shape. Now that wasn't eventually, a bit later became a church, but it was a starting point that was more suited to what the people were used to, the way they met. Some places in Africa, people will have uh, church services where the sermon will last for an hour or, or longer. That's normal for them, they're used to that. Boy, in, in America, if you preach for a whole hour, uh, you'd probably have to find a new job after you were done with that sermon. <laughs> um, what are people used to? Uh, all these things come into play in how we structure a church. But I want to think specifically of church structures in terms of small groups, large groups, and these kinds of questions. So keep in mind, biblical vision, values, and purposes are unchanging. Those are given to us in the Word of God. This is our authority. We don't want to depart from that. But methods in specific forms, they can be adaptable. And so even in the New Testament, we see different specific methods and forms of church life. So determining the appropriate structure of the church will also determine the method of planting the church, as I've already said. Now, let's talk about just some basic church structures as we observe them in the world today. And there's sort of a spectrum, as you can sort of see from left to right. And we can start out on this side with the traditional Western church. Now this would be the church the way most of us probably know it if you're from Europe or North America or from uh, Western culture. It's, uh, you have a building, people usually come together on Sunday morning for a couple of hours. Uh, you have uh, a certain time of singing, you have a time of preaching, and of course you may have announcements, I can't forget the announcements. Um, and, uh, and there's usually a pastor who is responsible for that. Very often there's a parish system which means there's one church for one neighborhood. This is very typical, say, in uh, the Orthodox Church or the Roman Catholic or the Lutheran or the Anglican Church, uh, that one church, one pastor, and, and they're responsible for this neighborhood. And you're really just supposed to go to that church. And um, uh, most everything happens together. Most of the events happen in that church building. Uh, people might get together informally with one another, but, but Christian events happen in the church building. And that's the way many of us know church. That's the only way most, many of us know church. So if there's Bible study, it's in the building, and very often it's the pastor teaching it. If it's worship service, it's in the building. If it's a women's meeting, it's in the building. And so there's a lot of programs that happen in that building, and it's very centralized. Well, as we begin to move to the other side of this spectrum, you have a traditional church that says, well, we'll have small groups also. And very often what happens is there might be a group of young people that say, you know, we want to study the Bible just with young people. So I say, okay, well, well, we'll start, you know, a young people's group. And maybe they meet in a home. Maybe they don't meet in the church. Or there's some people who live far out in, in a village they, they drive in and they attend the church in the city, but they say, you know, during the week, it's kind of long for us to drive back and forth, so can we start a, a Bible study just in a home out here? And say, okay, well, that's fine. You can have your Bible study in your home. But by and large, everything is still pretty much centralized in that central uh, traditional sort of church. And then you just have a few sort of specialized small groups for special interests or special needs. And this is the way a lot of churches have sort of developed. But then we come to something different, which is called the Cell Celebration Church. Um, the Cell Church is a very different concept. The Cell Church says the church doesn't primarily exist in the building with centralized programs, but rather there's two aspects to church life. One might be that larger Sunday morning meeting where everybody comes together. But equally important 
are what they call cell groups. And this would be small groups that usually meet in homes. These small groups may just have 10 or 12 people in them. They're obviously just going to be led by lay people. And it's in those small groups that the life of fellowship and Bible study, spiritual care, happens in these small groups. But then worship and the sense of being the people of God and the inspiration and the preaching, that comes in the larger meeting, what they call celebration, which we would typically call a Sunday morning worship service. Now you say, how is that really different from the traditional church with small groups? The fundamental difference is this. First of all, it's expected that everybody is in a small group. Second, the small groups or the cell groups are not just special interest groups. Well, this is just a women's group or this is just a young adults group. But these small groups are considered really the core life of the church. Because that's where the discipleship, that's where the spiritual care, that's where the church is experienced as family. How can I really experience family in a group with two or three hundred people on Sunday? But when I'm in a group with 10 or 12 people, we're family. We're praying for one another. We're talking about what the Bible means in our lives. If somebody's having difficulties and we're there to help. That's pretty hard to do in a big church where there's a couple of hundred people. And so the idea is that you actually decentralize the life of the church into these small groups, the caregiving of the church into these small groups, but then you still have the larger structure of your worship service for inspiration, for the stronger teaching and preaching. And you might have equipping. Usually cell, group, cell churches will have equipping for the cell group leaders. That's going to be a key to doing this well because you've decentralized the spiritual care into the, into the cell groups. You need to make sure those cell group leaders are well prepared to teach or to give counsel, um, and to lead those small groups, to be sort of the under shepherds. So this is the cell celebration, and it's become uh, quite widespread. Korea was famous for developing this with mega churches. There's a famous story about Yonggi Cho. I mentioned his church, you know, 500,000 members, and uh, these huge, almost stadium-like uh, church building where people would come together on Sunday. And uh, one time there's a story of somebody who had uh, sort of done a tour of this church and heard the story and, and said, you know, I don't think I could ever feel comfortable in a church that this, this big. And, and the pastor says, well, why not? And he said, well, because I'd be so anonymous. I'd just, I'd just be one of hundreds of thousands of people. He said, I've never heard that criticism of our church. He was going, what? No, because everybody needs to be in a cell group. And that's where you feel your family is. So it's a very different kind of philosophy. And this has been done in many other places in, in the world. Now, as we keep moving to this side, then you get what could be called a radical cell church or house church network. And this is where you may not have a centralized Sunday morning worship service at all. But you have the cell groups and the life of the church is carried on in the cell groups and maybe you only meet together for large meetings for equipping and teaching. The worship is in the small groups and the cell groups. Uh, or maybe you have once a month, you have a big celebration worship service. Well, see, then you don't have to have a big building to have that worship service. You can go rent, rent the concert hall in town and have a worship service there because everything's been now totally decentralized into small groups, but they're networked. So you may have a, an eldership, a leadership over all these cell groups. Each group has its own leader, but then there's leaders that are giving equipping to them. So that would be the radical uh, cell church that's, that really doesn't have an emphasis on centralized meetings at all. But then to the very farthest on this sort of part of the spectrum would be the autonomous house church movement where each really cell group is its own church in itself. And so it might meet in a home and uh, there might be only 20 people in that house church. 
uh, but they're their own church. They consider themselves the church independent, um, only very, very loosely connected with other house churches if they're connected at all. And so this is a whole spectrum. And the more on this side with the autonomous house church or networked house church, this is what we're seeing in places like China where uh, the government is very restrictive of public worship and there are registered churches, but it's very limited what can happen there. And the explosive growth has been in these unregistered house churches. They meet in homes. Some of them are actually quite large, may have 100 people, uh, so they don't fit in a typical house. But um, they would be more on this side of the spectrum. Of course, in Western culture, where you have a history of Christianity and, and structures, the churches tend to look more like this. So what we're going to do is uh, we'll be talking about some of the pros and cons of these different structures, different ways of, of structuring the life of the church, and how they fit in, in different cultural contexts and some of the advantages, disadvantages. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com.